one in Amsterdam. Lots of content today. So, um, today I'm going to share you a little bit of how at HSBC uh, we use data and machine learning to improve the payment experience for some of our customers in Hong Kong. First of all, who are we? Who, what's HSBC? HSBC is one of the biggest financial organizations in the world. Uh, we serve more than 39 million customers uh, uh, in 66 uh, countries and territories. And uh, we have been around for a long time, uh, 154 years. As such, we have a pretty substantial footprint, uh, both in terms of data centers. Uh, we run and operate uh, 20, uh, data centers in 21 uh, of those 66 countries. Uh, and also in terms of data. Uh, last time we counted, we had 170 petabytes and it's growing very fast. So this data is data that we generate and process to serve our customers, to provide them banking services, uh, as well as understand what their needs are uh, so we can serve them uh, better. Um, a lot of what HSBC does day to day is to facilitate payments. Uh, from families paying their electricity bill or, or the rent uh, to uh, big corporations and facilitating international commerce. Um, about a couple of years ago, uh, we identified an unmet need in uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is one of our major markets and, and home markets. And the unmet need was uh, how you could send money to friends and family uh, simply and conveniently. So, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the options at the time were uh, pretty cumbersome. Uh, uh, it wasn't unusual if you had to pay a friend that uh, bank with a different bank from your own, uh, for you to go to an ATM, withdraw some cash, and then walk uh, down the street to the bank that your friend was using and depositing the same cash on his or uh, her bank account. Uh, so this way of transferring money was risky, it was cumbersome, it was low, and we knew uh, that we could do better. So a couple of years ago, uh, HSBC launched um, a social P2P application in Hong Kong uh, called PayMe. Um, we started with just P2P. As I said, we were facilitating uh, payment and transfer between friends and family uh, instantly and for free. Um, uh, not long um, afterwards, we uh, also launched a sister product called PayMe for Business. Uh, which targets merchants that wants to collect payments online and in-store uh, from users that uh, use the PayMe uh, P2P app. Um, a lot of businesses uh, uh, took up that product um, because uh, they, it gives access to the money they collect uh, immediately, uh, unlike other traditional payment methods like credit card. As you know, uh, the merchant do not receive the cash uh, um, until one or two weeks after uh, the payment has been made. Um, we experienced a very steady growth um, for this uh, um, uh, pay me uh, service. We now have about uh, uh, 1.8 million customers and in a city of 7 million customers, they're quite a significant um, um, subset of the, of the population. And we are launching continuously new features targeting both consumers as well as merchants. Um, last week, um, we discovered from an article on the press that to pay me has also become a widely used verb uh, in Hong Kong. So along the lines of people saying, oh, uh, I'll Google this, uh, people say, I'll pay me you later. So uh, this is pretty amazing and a discovery, and it was also pretty humbling, uh, to be honest. Um, but we did not want uh, to keep building, uh, designing and building feature uh, based on hunches, so what we thought were problems uh, that we wanted to solve for our customer. Uh, we wanted to make data-driven decision and uh, uh, as such have a data-driven uh, roadmap uh, so we can make sure that we work on features that really solve problems uh, that people um, have in Hong Kong. Um, so we applied some creative uh, technique to uh, make sense and analyze the data uh, that we had uh, at our disposal. And uh, I'm going to give you two examples of type of analysis that we do uh, before I go uh, about talking how uh, we do this in terms of technology. First of all, I have to tell you that when you make a payment with PayMe as a user, you have to type in a payment message. It can be text, it can be emoji, um, a lot of people use it uh, um, uh, emoji, uh, but you have to, uh, to write a message. Uh, what do we do with this message? Well, we display it on the screen uh, into a social timeline uh, that allows people to discover what their friends have been going on about and, uh, um, and uh, 
um, and, and, and do the same, basically. Um, we also use uh, um, NLP techniques to analyze these messages and uh, uh, categorize them into uh, level one and level two uh, categories. We are basically trying to understand uh, what the intent uh, behind the payment was. For instance, if I go out with my friends and I pay them back for uh, um, sushi with uh, um, Jonathan, um, we can understand that the payment was for a level one category uh, dining, and uh, level two category is uh, Japanese or sushi. Uh, we understand that it's a social situation, so it wasn't me uh, alone. And uh, um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of information. And we identify 12 categories, uh, L1 so far, and much more um, L2. Uh, we do this in three languages. Uh, Hong Kong uh, uses English, um, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese as a written um, languages. And uh, if you think that NLP is like a solve problem, well, that may be so for English, but for other uh, languages, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not quite that. Um, in particular, in Hong Kong, people speak Cantonese, uh, which is uh, um, a, a language that is written using Chinese traditional characters, but has a lot of uh, slang, as peculiar um, expressions that are typical to Hong Kong only. So it, it was a very hard problem um, to tackle um, for us. Uh, and of course, uh, emojis, right? A lot of our targets are millennial uh, users, and they use emoji a lot. Uh, when you type on a mobile, uh, you type a word, the Yoto suggests you an emoji, so we had to do a lot of work uh, um, for emoji. Um, as I mentioned before, um, data-driven roadmap. Like when we were uh, doing this analysis for PayMe, and back then it was just uh, a P2P, we realized that uh, a substantial um, number of transactions was consumer to business payment. Uh, so um, shops that were using a P2P application to collect payments uh, for their business. Um, so um, we addressed this need, as I said, by launching a, a Pay Me for Business application, which is uh, dedicated to the merchant so they can collect money and uh, um, use insight to uh, know how to grow uh, their business. So this is one example of what I uh, mentioned uh, when I say data-driven roadmap. The data tell us that there is a need to meet, and we address that. And that's a screenshot of me for business. <laughs> um, there's another uh, very cool analysis that we do. Um, I said before that PayMe is a social P2P application, right? So, being a social P2P application, um, users are a part of a network, and uh, uh, the nodes of this network are connected um, to each other uh, by means of the interactions that they had. So uh, interaction is, for instance, I send a friend request, or I pay a friend, or I receive a payment for a friend. Um, so we build um, a network of all the payment users and all the um, direct edges being payments that are sent uh, from each one another. And uh, um, we started analyzing. Um, on the screen, you see as an example um, one, the network of one particular user uh, back in Jan 2019. Now you see the two degrees of, uh, um, of this network. The blue nodes are the first um, degree connection, and the red one are the second uh, degree connection. So we put all the payment users in, 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 a, in a network, and uh, we apply network science techniques to analyze this network. A, a few interesting things came up. So, the basic and simple things that you, that you can imagine. Uh, we can count uh, the number of edges, so we can understand whether the engaged users versus the users that do not use uh, the application much, so we can target them to um, make them more engaged. Um, we identified that there were a different topology between uh, um, consumer and merchants. As you can imagine, a merchant just have inbound edges because they typically just collect payments, whereas a P2P user has an equal number of inbound and outbound edges, because it's a different way they use the application. Um, the cool thing, though, the very cool thing, is that we can predict interactions on the network. So that's exactly what you see on the screen, right? So given a pay me user, um, we, we, we identified that the second degree nodes, like prospect A, that have more than one common neighbor with a sample user, in this case, more than one common neighbor in a click shape, like a triangle shape connection, are 4.5 times more likely to establish a connection with a sample user uh, in the next three months compared to uh, second degree nodes that do not have the same configuration like uh, uh, prospect B. So uh, we use this, amongst other things, to recommend you um, 
users or merchants. And uh, one example is uh, uh, the quick pay. Why do we do this? We do this because uh, um, we identify that engaged users, so users that have uh, more than a certain number of uh, friends, uh, are less likely to abandon the platform than users that have uh, below that certain number of friends. So as you, um, you know, um, get the application, we try to push you to have uh, a substantial number of friends, so um, you, you, we retain you. you. You do not abandon us. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities. Those were just two examples. Uh, we realized pretty quickly, though, that um, having reliable data pipelines and the data to do these analytics was key to the success um, of the analysis that we do. Um, on top of that, we want to enable our team to do self-service uh, analytics. And uh, we are a bank, so you can imagine we have all the uh, usual problems about uh, uh, data confidentiality and security um, when, it's, uh, when it comes to um, customer data. So, we went through a few iterations of, of our platform before we settled to uh, the solution that we have now. And each of these iterations reveal a new problem that we have to solve. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about three of these challenges uh, that we had um, when building uh, the platform. So in PayMe, uh, we, can, uh, we have diverse data sources, and uh, we can broadly categorize them into two uh, different uh, categories. Slow-moving data sources, uh, like user profile and settings, so things that do not change um, a lot, uh, that we ingest in batches. So we have different batches with different frequencies. Some are daily, some are minutes. Um, uh, and they come from DB or storage or other data sources. Some other are fast moving. Uh, so again, payments, uh, user interaction that we track on the application. Uh, we track what user clicks, uh, how they scroll and stuff like that. And we ingest them in near real time as they are streaming um, type of data. Um, and then we have different users of this data, right? So data scientists in particular, um, when we started, they, they each have a dedicated virtual machine with their own choice of tool. Um, some were using Jupyter and, and Python, some were using RStudio. And um, they typically want to have access to all the raw data um, with no restrictions. Uh, another category of users that we have is uh, data analysts. Uh, when I say data analysts, I also mean like uh, uh, product managers, uh, marketing people, sales people, so just generic, non-technical users. They typically use BI tools, in our case, Tableau, and they want to have access to a subtest of a very um, well-modeled um, data. Uh, they don't want the raw um, unstructured data. In between, data engineers, of course, they want to um, provide data to these two uh, type of people uh, in an accurate and, and timely manner. So when we started, uh, we did what was look, looked simple at the time, which is uh, we were uh, uh, creating uh, dumps of our operational database, run SQL script, mask all sensitive data, and just copy over to the data scientist uh, VM. Uh, of course, bad idea, didn't work. Um, first of all, it was manual. Um, it took a lot of time to export, mask, uh, and move over. We have a lot of data sources in all these virtual machines, so they were all not aligned, they were old. Um, to make matters worse, uh, we are a bank, so there are strict rules about how you, uh, what you have to do when you export data from a production environment. So you have to involve different people from different teams. Uh, people have to review manually, you know, eyeball review, the data source and the masking scripts, and that, that has to happen every single time. So, you know, data was old, uh, weeks old, if you are lucky, and uh, um, it wasn't really working for us. Um, another challenge that we had is that um, data scientists were very happy because they were working on environments that were tailored to their needs. They had exactly the tool they want and exactly the libraries they want. This is another way to say that the models they wrote typically run only on those virtual machines and not somewhere else, right? So um, environments were different, settings were different, data sources were different. So um, the result is that we were limited to what we could do by just SQL queries on data because uh, um, it was very hard for us to productionize a model if you could do that at all, right? So we knew that we had to change if we wanted to be successful. And um, how do we solve this challenge? Well. Um, we use Databricks as a runtime platform for a little thing that we created. Uh, we created a number of jobs at different frequencies that, as I said before, were ingesting data um, into Delta. Um, we were actually piping the data into two different, uh, separate, completely separate Databricks environments. Uh, one was production, uh, where we had all the uh, data unmasked, uh, PII, customer data, sensitive data, you name it. And the other one was uh, what we call discovery, that contains exactly the same volume, the same type of data, 
but uh, de-identified. So we automate the schema validation and ingestion on both of those environments um, and the execution of the masking scripts as well, so we didn't have to uh, do any manual review um, anymore. Um, if the schema validation fails, so the data has additional fields compared to what we expect, this data, this, this new data, is automatically masked and uh, an alert is sent to the team so that they may create a custom de-identification rule for that. So uh, in this way, we, s we are safe. We prevent data, uh, sensitive data leakage into the discovery environment. Um, what do we do with the discovery environment? Well, the data scientists uh, um, use them. Uh, to do um, all the data discovery, iterative feature engineering, and it's the same environment that uh, the data engineers are using. Uh, it's not unusual for a data scientist to uh, write some program that clean up and extract features, and then the data engineers take the same program and then uh, you know, productionize it or make it part of a bigger uh, pipeline. So, um, so this way of working iteratively and in collaboration works very well for us. And of course, um, it's, it's good for us because we have one single platform to do data storage, data pipelines, data engineers, um, work, and, and it's just everything in one place. Uh, things like uh, um, role-based access control or uh, you know, cluster management is done for us, uh, so that's a plus. Um, we close the circle, so we also build some um, our own pipelines to publish uh, notebooks, uh, codes, and data sources into production. And uh, production is where we run uh, uh, the models and the data pipelines uh, on real data to generate insights for uh, our customers. We have not forgot our data analyst user. They still use Tableau. Uh, we just point Tableau to uh, Delta. Uh, Delta is also where we store the output of our models and our analysis, um, so they can um, connect to production or discovery, uh, depending on uh, um, if their, their visualization or the reporting of what they have to do requires PII or not. As you may imagine, uh, we use discovery uh, for the reports and the analysis that do not require PII because it's easier for us to iterate there. We don't have to go through the process of publishing stuff in production and, and so on and so forth. So to summarize, um, we built on top of Databricks uh, a single unified platform uh, to uh, run our data engineering, our data analytics, and the data science um, workloads. Um, we've seen major improvements uh, in the speed uh, of which we have data available in the system uh, for our analysis. Uh, we spend less time on data pipelines. Um, both in terms of manual time, like people do not have to do things because it's all automated, uh, as well as compute time. Uh, there were a number of batch that uh, used to take six hours when we run um, outside of the platform, and now they take six seconds. So shorter, cheaper, you name it. The teams are happier. They really love the tool. Uh, we have a few data engineers and data scientists from our team, so if you want to talk to them, they will tell you. Uh, most importantly, um, the fact that we, are, uh, uh, we have a platform that makes it easy um, to create and test models um, enable a proposition for HSBC where the insights are not just something that we produce for internal consumption. Insights, we package them and we serve them uh, through our app to our customers. So uh, the insights are, in, are, are an integral part of, of, of what we uh, provide to our customer of the product, right? So that's all I had for today. Uh, we are just getting started, so I hope um, I will be able to show you um, much more at the next uh, uh, Spark Summit. Uh, if you're curious and you cannot wait, we have a booth uh, in the Expo Hall, so um, come talk to us, and uh, thank you.